Welcome to the Transnational Asia Speaker Series sponsored by Rice University's Chow Center for Asian Studies. My name is Susan Huang. I've been teaching Asian art at Rice for 14 years. Recently, I joined the new Department of Transnational Asian Studies, which is in the historic building, Lovett Hall, you see behind me. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tenson Sen, Professor of History and the Director of the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai and Global Network Professor at New York University. Uh, Dr. Sen is a very productive scholar. His two monographs, Buddhism, Diplomacy and Trade, the Realignment of Sino-Indian Re Relations, 600 to 1400, first published in 2003, and India, China, and the World, A Connected History, first published in 2017, are wi widely known to the field and have been and remain very influential. He has co-authored co with Victor Mayer, uh, Traditional China in Asian and World History, published in 2012. He edited Buddhism Across Asia, Networks of Material, Culture, and Intellectual Exchange, published in 2014, and co-edited with Berhard Schnepel, Traveling Past the Politics of Culture Heritage in the Indian Ocean World, published in 2019. Uh, there is a new volume he co-edited with uh, Brian Tui, uh, Beyond Pan-Asianism, Collecting China and India, 1840s to 1960s. Uh, this book will soon be published by Oxford University Press. Congratulations. Dr. Sen is currently working on three other major projects, a book about Zheng He's maritime expedition in the early 15th century, a monograph on Jawaharlal, Nehru, and China. And he is also co-editing with Anson Ho, The Cambridge History of the Indian Ocean, Volume 1. Uh, we are extremely uh, honored and excited that Dr. Sen will be speaking to us about the Buddhist cosmopolis, connectivity, diversity, and materiality in the Buddhist world. Uh, after his talk, we will have a Q&A for 30 minutes. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please click the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type your question. I shall pass your questions uh, to our speaker. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tenson Sen. Thank you, uh, Susan, uh, for, uh, for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, I'm fascinated by the new department uh, at RISE. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't visit uh, the fabulous building that you have behind you, but at some point, uh, maybe we'll collaborate because many of the things that we do uh, at NYU Shanghai at the Center for Global Asia matches up with your department. And in fact, one of our previous fellows is now uh, at your department as well. So those those kinds of connections uh, could continue uh, at, at some point. In fact, I have to mention that one of my students is actually trying to work on your topic uh, on, on the seals, the Taoist seals and, and divination purposes. So uh, there are lots of things we can do uh, jointly. Uh, so let me try to start uh, sharing the screen and see if it works properly. Um, and we'll go from there. Uh, it takes a couple of seconds uh, for it to show up, but uh, uh, Susan, if you can tell me if, if you can see the screen, my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so my my discussion today is looking at uh, uh, Buddhism more broadly, uh, looking at the connections, uh, and also looking at some of the conceptual ways in which we can understand uh, the Buddhist connections. It will mostly focus on. Uh, the pre-20th century, but I'll also mention a little bit about uh, the later periods as well. Um, and uh, let's see if, uh, th there are a couple of uh, issues that I wanted to address as uh, conceptual background uh, to what uh, I'm going to talk today. Uh, the first is of course, the notion of cosmopolis. Uh, uh, and the second is the issue of connections. Uh, third is the issue of convergence. Uh, and since I'm a historian, uh, what has fascinated me, especially looking at China-India connections 
the long durée starting with the early Buddhist connections to the contemporary 1950s to present day uh, uh, connections is this notion of circulatory history. And I'll, I'll say a few things about uh, these uh, before I get into some of the uh, issues about Buddhism. Um, so uh, the, the cosmopolis, the idea of cosmopolis that I see uh, it's essentially a small world or a world uh, at, as it expands. So a world for me is not only just people, but also objects, uh, animals, uh, and, and they make up uh, interesting ways uh, to understand the various kinds of connections within the society. And again, emphasizing the connections are not just among people, but uh, with other material uh, cultures and, and uh, issues, and, and in fact, animals, if you go to a zoo and, and so forth. Um, the idea of cosmopolis uh, as a space uh, is to transcend locality. Um, this is that connections are made beyond a specific geographical location uh, through the going in and coming out of people, moving of objects, uh, transmission of, of ideas. So there is a kind of connections that goes beyond a, a local region uh, through this idea of cosmopolis. And that's one thing uh, I also wanted to emphasize. Uh, the third point I wanted to emphasize, and this is something I'm going to talk about with regard to the Buddhist cosmopolis, is the diversity of, of cosmopolis. Right? Um, it has many different languages, and we see this in many cities, um, cultures, uh, schools of thoughts, many different objects, many different kinds of circulations. But at the same time, there are conflicts, conflicts between members of the society with other societies and, and so forth. So that I think is also part of uh, a cosmopolis world in which conflicts do exist. And in the case of Buddhism, also we find various kinds of sectarian uh, conflicts happening between different Buddhist schools in a given location. Uh, but they, there's some sort of unification that takes place um, within the cosmopolis, even though they may be diverse. Uh, and again, that's a, something I'm going to talk about with regard to Buddhism, even though Buddhism is practiced uh, differently in different places, there seems to be some common elements, and so that unifies that. So that's that's basically the cosmopolis that I wanted to uh, emphasize, and and this has been used in different ways uh, in the study of Rome, for example, early Roman Empire. These are a couple of books that emphasizes uh, the cosmopolitan nature of of Roman Empire. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sima Alavi's work on Islam. Um, uh, Muslim cosmopolitanism, uh, and then we have this very famous work by Sheldon Pollack uh, on, on Sanskrit cosmopolis. Uh, so we have on one side uh, religion and the other side language. Uh, Sheldon Pollack uh, talks about South Asia and Southeast Asia united uh, through uh, Sanskrit. Um, so these are some of the, uh, the works that I have used to understand my notion uh, of, of a cosmopolis. Um, with regard to uh, connections, then uh, connections are entanglements of various regions, people, ideas, and objects. Um, but as the connections take place, there's a mixing and transformation of things. I mean, I think the transformation is an important part of this connection. As things move, they tend to change. And then again, we see that uh, in, in the case of of a Buddhism uh, as well as Buddhist ideas, objects move, they tend to change um, in, in, the, in the course of connections and circulations. Um, but the connections could be to one special event uh, from different sites uh, to a period by different uh, locations, to an era, to a, comp, uh, to a phenomena, weather related, climate related, where people are connected to a specific object, event, and, and so forth. Um, I think uh, uh, images and objects have to be considered as important part of connections. They have agencies and anthropologists and others have, have written about uh, the agency of objects and, and especially images. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the case of, of Buddhism. Uh, the other thing that uh, I wanted to emphasize, and this came up when I was doing Buddhist connections between China and India is the imaginary connections knowing the fact that um, many people can't move or could not move during the pre-modern times, um, their connections to the holy lands uh, of, of Buddhism in South Asia was through imag ima imagination. So that I think is an important part of connection as well, even though there's no physical connection, 
there is uh, imaginary connection. The other part is uh, this idea of convergence. Um, uh, this is uh, Homi Baba, a recent introduction to a book uh, where he talks about the space uh, convergence creates, uh, convergence and connections come together to create a very unique uh, spatial and temporal space that, that again, I'm going to talk that as well uh, with, a, with a case study uh, for Buddhism. So that I think is an important part to understand uh, Buddhism as it moved from one place to, to another. Um, finally, the circulatory history. This is um, uh, Prasenjit Dwara's recent book in which he points out uh, the, the circulatory history that he wants to emphasize is the mode in which ideas, uh, practices, and texts enter society or, or locale as one kind of thing and emerge from it, uh, change, transform, uh, to travel elsewhere. And we see that in in in, in the case of Buddhism, uh, but also one thing that he points out, it's not moving on to a third place. Sometimes it comes back to where it originated. Uh, and I, I'm not going to uh, give the example here. I've written an article about how uh, Buddhism from China comes back uh, to India, uh, transformed. Uh, this is with regard to Chinese migrants coming into South Asia, bringing Chinese forms of Buddhism into Calcutta, for example, and, and if you are interested, you can take a look at that article. Uh, and this is what uh, circulation uh, for me means that things that originated come back, change or transform to the place of origin. And that's what uh, uh, Prasenjit Dwara was arguing in his book as well. Uh, so let me start with the uh, emerging Buddhist uh, cosmopolis uh, and, and uh, a few issues related to this Buddhist cosmopolis um, here. Uh, uh, the, the main thing here, when we look at the spread of Buddhisms, and, and you'll notice that I put an S uh, after Buddhism, uh, of course, when you do that, the, the Microsoft Word underlines it uh, in red because there are no such word. Uh, but for me, Buddhisms uh, should be used in order to say or talk about different forms of Buddhisms uh, that existed uh, along not only Asia, but other places as well. One thing that stands out uh, for me as I look at the early transmission uh, of, of Buddhism from South Asia to other places or within South Asia uh, is the role of the state uh, or the official transmission. Many of the times uh, it will be something that was created later on, but uh, we know in the case of Ashoka and, and spread of Buddhism clearly within, within India or so-called India now, um, the transmission of Buddhism uh, to Sri Lanka, the transmission of, of Buddhism to China somehow historically or perhaps uh, later on um, created notions that state played an important role uh, in the transmission of Buddhism. This is to legitimize often the, the transmission of Buddhism in, in foreign lands. Um, for me, it has been an important role to look at uh, you know, the role of traders uh, and trading networks. Uh, my first book was about the connection between Buddhism and trade. Uh, and then it is very clear from the very early on um, that there's a connection between how Buddhist ideas, objects, uh, people move, uh, they, they actually travel uh, on uh, networks created by traders. Uh, the role of images uh, is important. Uh, I think the first encounter with Buddhism in many areas uh, come through looking at images. Uh, images are very powerful. Um, given the fact that many people were illiterate, um, did not understand uh, some of the complex philosophies and teachings of Buddhism, images for them was the first contact for Buddhism. And, and we see that in, in China, and I'll say about that. Um, the other aspect of, of this transmission of Buddhism we tend to forget is the misperceptions uh, about Buddhism uh, also play an important role um, in, in uh, ultimately Buddhism moving to a foreign place, uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So we should not dismiss uh, the misperceptions that people may have had about Buddhism um, and, and the original teachings uh, uh, as, as we see from China, for example. Uh, also very important certainly uh, is missionary and translation work, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, as well. Now, this is a transmission of, of, uh, of Buddhism to Sri Lanka, and, and of course, these are later images, but again, emphasizing how uh, some of these things uh, are portrayed through images. This is to, again, emphasize the importance of the transmission of Buddhism 
let's say legitimate transmission of Buddhism as maybe the Buddhist community wants you to understand. Um, so this kind of things we find in Sri Lanka, but also in China, uh, where uh, one of the very uh, famous stories about uh, the transmission of Buddhism relates to the coming of uh, this uh, two monks from, from India on a, with, with a white horse, uh, and this is in, in, in Loyang. Um, and the, there's images as well in Tunhuang that you see uh, connecting Buddhism uh, to the emperor. Um, this is, uh, of course, a later fabrication. Uh, we know that the transmission of Buddhism uh, most likely did not take place uh, because of an invitation that was sent by the Han emperor. Uh, rather, I, uh, I've written about this as well. What we see uh, the coming of Buddhism initially is very much like what happened in South Asia itself, Buddhism, Buddhist ideas uh, spread through trading networks uh, within uh, India, from India to, to Sri Lanka uh, and other places. And, and this has been mapped out some of the important role uh, trading networks play uh, with regard to supporting uh, the Buddhist com com uh, communities and Buddhist Sanghas, uh, which are located uh, near urban centers. And, and this, this map really uh, points out where some of these uh, Buddhist communities were, were located in India and, and they are right next to the trade routes and, and we can see uh, the mutual support the trading community and, and the, uh, the Buddhist community had uh, during the early phase. And, and the same uh, can be seen um, in, in China. So this is, uh, these are some of the early images of Buddhist uh, divinities uh, or, or Buddhist donors um, from uh, Kung Ang Shan uh, in, in, in China. Um, they are images most likely done by trading communities, um, most likely foreign trading communities settled uh, in the eastern coast of, of, of China. Um, and and um, these seems to be some of uh, important ways we can see the first contact may have taken place between foreign communities practicing Buddhism uh, in China and the local people. So images, again, emphasizing seems to have played an important role uh, in the transmission. And then we can see that uh, in a way in which some of these images were incorporated within the traditional uh, Chinese uh, practices. Um, and Susan was talking about Wu Hung's lecture that is perhaps taking place at the same time. Uh, he has written about this um, and, and he has argued that uh, these images that we find uh, in Sichuan should be considered as Taoist rather than Buddhist. Um, and, and, and the issue is that, you know, people using these images uh, saw it according to whatever they wanted to see it, right? So uh, these are most likely uh, in a funerary uh, place where uh, the divinity is used for uh, ideas about afterlife. Um, so this is, uh, people would say it's a misperception uh, of Buddhism, but I think it plays an important role. Uh, this is incorporating Buddhist images, uh, even though it may be misperceived, but this is the making inroads into the Chinese society. So that way of, of bringing in Buddhism, even though it's misconceived, misplaced, uh, it's, it's fine. I think that that plays an important role and, and we should look at that and not, not neglect that aspect of how Buddhism uh, is incorporated in different ways into a foreign society. Uh, this is a traditional way in which uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism uh, and its spread is seen uh, in China. Translation plays a very important role. Uh, Buddhist texts were mostly translated, commentaries were written on that. But what is fascinating uh, to me has been the collaboration that took place uh, in, in person reciting the text, somebody doing an oral translation, somebody writing it down. Uh, and then somebody editing. And, and most of the times it's different kinds of different groups of people involved, so Parthians, Indo-Scythians, Sogdians, Indians, Chinese, all collaborating. And, and so this process that we can see all the way through the Song Dynasty is really a fascinating way in which um, this idea of a Buddhist cosmopolis can be seen uh, and perceived during the translation workshops, you can, if you want to call that. Um, and, and all these people coming from different regions, speaking different languages, um, knowing certain languages, not knowing certain languages, aware of certain script, not aware of certain script. Uh, but this is really, uh, I think, a fascinating macrocosm of what uh, I would say the what this cosmopolis uh, would be. So that's that's uh, all these things I think are, are important part of this uh, cosmopolis. Now, if, if, if we understand uh, the, the Buddhist cosmopolis, and I'll come back and show you some of the early 
uh, places where, where the Buddhist uh, ideas were spread. But um, clearly what we have are multiple centers uh, of, of Buddhism uh, before uh, sixth century. So if you look at uh, the, the areas that are emerging before the sixth century, we know that uh, there are multiple sites uh, within South Asia, of course, uh, Buddhism, Buddhist communities, uh, caves, and, and so forth. But, but China has also emerged by the fifth century as, as one of the key locations uh, of Buddhism and its uh, coastal regions. Uh, it's also hinterland, um, Central Asia, parts of Central Asia also emerging. But also, we should not forget that uh, in Burma, there also are sites that predate uh, fifth, sixth century. Uh, in which we find early Buddhist uh, images, early Buddhist practices, uh, sites, and, and, and so forth. Um, so for me, I think the fifth century uh, is perhaps a watershed and, and the post uh, fifth century marks a rapid spread uh, of, of Buddhism to many different uh, locations. Uh, and, and here, um, two factors I think play an important role uh, in, in this transmission. One is expanding uh, mercantile uh, communities and networks. Uh, and this happens mostly through the maritime uh, sites as well. So we find one of the earliest evidence of the maritime transmission of Buddhism in Kedah uh, in, in Malaysia. Um, we also find at this time, um, uh, Buddhism being transmitted to Japan, uh, it spreads to Tibet, and this is ha happening after the fifth century. Uh, but also the semi-nomadic uh, people in, in northern China, the, the Liao, the, the Sisya, and the Mongols. So this is happening after the after the sixth century, um, and and mer mercantile network is one, and then the state using Buddhism to legitimize itself, especially among the semi-nomadic people, it becomes an important way of creating an identity. Um, and this, of course, in the tenth, eleventh, twelfth centuries. Um, that these nomadic people are using Buddhism for. So this, this is a very interesting phenomena that uh, we can take a look at uh, uh, how Buddhism gradually spreads and, and, and is accepted in different locations for different reasons. Um, what has interested me uh, uh, is the maritime transmission of, of Buddhism. Uh, I've been working on Indian Ocean connections. Um, so uh, the maritime Southeast Asia, other than Burma, which is an upland Southeast Asia, it's a fascinating way we see some of the early evidence in Chao Chir, um, in, in Vietnam today, um, from where uh, people are trading, Sokians, um, but spreading Buddhism as well. So Kang Sang Hui is one of the major figures from this area. But we also find in Malaysia, Kedah, the second um, circle in, in red, uh, evidence of early Buddhism there as well. So the maritime transmission of Buddhism uh, is also fascinating that that uh, that we see. And this is um, this uh, so-called so the Buddha Gupta inscription. This particular one is in Kedah, but the actual inscription is in Calcutta. Uh, and this talks about uh, the role of merchant uh, in donating uh, uh, things to the to the Buddha. So this dates from the fifth century. It's very important. Uh, evidence, in my opinion, on the spread of Buddhism through the maritime routes. So what's happening because of these different kinds of transmissions is the multiple forms of Buddhisms are, are coming out in, in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, people using multiple languages. Uh, there are multiple groups of people. There are multiple pilgrimage sites uh, and learning centers. I think the last point is important because not only are people practicing um, the religion differently, but they can go to different places, uh, their own holy sites or their own learning sites uh, across Asia. So these are some of the important sites that we see mostly post uh, sixth century. Wutai Shan becomes uh, a leading pilgrimage sites, um, site for not only people in China, but East Asia and even India. Indian monks start going to Wutai Shan from around the seventh, eighth centuries. Uh, Bodh Gaya uh, is recognized as an important holy site and people are going there. Uh, Kandy, Sri Lanka, many sites in Kandy uh, and, and around Kandy in Sri Lanka are places where people are going, uh, including uh, Amoga Virjra would go to Sri Lanka in, in during the Tang dynasty to collect uh, uh, esoteric documents and, and texts. Palembang uh, is also very fascinating. We tend to forget uh, the role that Southeast Asia plays in the transmission uh, of Buddhism, um, Palembang, which was uh, most likely the capital of the Srivijaya polity, 
uh, is mentioned in uh, one of the very interesting travelers to, to India again, after Fasian and Xuanzang, I Ching, again, somebody people tend to forget, um, writes two important texts about his travels. Uh, and, and clearly one is his travel from Guangzhou through uh, Palembang, most likely in, through Keda to India. And now what he is mentioning here is of course, um, one of the important sites of Buddhism in China, the, the ancient capital Chang'an, uh, and, and also the southern coastal region of Guangzhou where he gets support from the local uh, ruler uh, or, or governor uh, for his travel. He comes to Palembang where he studies Sanskrit and then he uh, goes to Kedah. Uh, and from Kedah, he takes another ship and goes to India and, and visits all these holy sites. But what is important about uh, I Ching's writings uh, is not just about the one, uh, his travels and comparing how Buddhism is practiced in China and India, uh, the monastic rules that he is interested in. But he also mentions monks from Sri Lanka coming to Nalanda to study. He also mentions uh, Korean monks uh, coming to Nalanda and studying some of them die in, in Nalanda. But this is a fascinating place where again, this cosmopolis, a larger expanding cosmopolis is brought together in this institution of higher learning called Nalanda, which Xuanzang also, also mentions. But this is a gathering of all these different groups of people from around Asia and, and coming together in pursuit of study uh, of, of Buddhism. So that's why I think I Ching's um, uh, second uh, book, which is about the, the monks, the, uh, the biographies of monks, uh, which needs to be translated uh, again, um, is, is really fascinating to understand how different people come together in the practice and study of Buddhism. Now, what, what he does is, is clearly points out the multi-directional movement of Buddhist monks, artifacts, and knowledge extending from South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, all the way to Korea. I think that's an important part to understand this, this notion of Buddhist cosmopolis. Multiple learning centers uh, and translation uh, places, uh, which he himself experiences, Chang'an, Palembang in Southeast Asia, and Nalanda. Uh, intimate connections between state mercantile groups and Buddhist monks clearly seen through his travels. So I, I would say, if we are going to understand how the Buddhist cosmopolis was in the seventh century, I Ching's works, both his texts would be quite important to understand uh, the diversity of the Buddhist cosmopolis as well as the connection um, within the Buddhist cosmopolis. So that's um, basically where I get to the unifying part of the Buddhist uh, cosmopolis. And I want to mention, couple of, of things that bring and uh, using the concepts that I was talking about at the beginning of the talk, um, how the Buddhist cosmopolis, even though they may, die, may be very diverse, practicing different forms of Buddhism, having different sites of learning and pilgrimage. Um, one thing that of course brings them together is the faith in the Buddha, in the past, the future, or whatever that may be the, 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 its image of the Buddha, the, the perception of the Buddha, the worship of the Buddha, uh, and so forth. The Buddhas could be local Buddha, it can be uh, uh, others. Um, there are many different kinds of Buddhas that will emerge later on in the 1920th century. But there's a sense of imagined community uh, to borrow uh, Benedict Anderson's um, idea uh, that they, they think they belong to something even if they practice the religion differently, they may have sectarian issues, but there's certain sense of, of being part of a larger whole. Um, one of the issues that uh, I see uh, important here is how no matter what kind of Buddhism they practice, they value certain objects, uh, certainly the relic of the Buddha uh, or Buddha sense, uh, very, very important. Uh, and this valuing of the, of the artifacts uh, I think is quite important, and I'll say a little bit about, about that as well. But clearly, certain objects move around because there is a common emphasis of uh, having those. The relics did matter because it's connected to the idea that Buddhism is declining. And one of the ways you can um, preserve Buddhism is to collect uh, some of the artifacts. Uh, this is happening in the 10th, 11th century, and relics form an important part of that. But connections also take place through convergence. And I wanted to give you an example of, of this. I've written about uh, this example before. This is a, a fascinating tomb from the, uh, the Liao dynasty. Uh, actually, there are series of tombs from the Liao dynasty, which is, which is here uh, around 10th, 11th centuries. Uh, and, and 
just remembering what Homi Bhabha had said that um, these kinds of circulations or connections create new spaces of convergence, right? Uh, and, and we see this new space of convergence taking place, not in Sung China, but at the semi-nomadic Liao tombs uh, belonging to Han people who have died in, in the Liao territory. And they are drawing very fascinating things in, in their, their tombs. Um, and, and you can see the artifacts, you can see the coffin of one of them. The body is cremated, uh, that is burned. Ashes are put into that coffin, if you see the coffin here. Um, dharanis are written on, on this coffin. Um, but what I was interested in was this diagram that appeared on the ceilings of uh, the tombs of all these family members. So there are about eight or nine tombs and, and each of them have this drawing and the ceiling of, of the tomb. And why is this a diagram interesting? Um, it's because of number of things that show up. Um, so for example, this is where uh, a bronze mirror used to be, which has dropped to the ground. Uh, uh, and, and this is how it seems one of the things that was excavated from the tomb, this might have been the thing in the center of the image. But beyond that is this lotus. Um, and, and we see lotus as an important symbol of Buddhism. Um, but around the, the lotus are the nine luminaries or seven luminaries. Uh, this is a Chinese concept of, of, of mapping the heaven. Uh, the same is true of the next, uh, the Ashabasu, the lunar mansions that are depicted here as well. So you can see many different things coming together. And the last one is the most fascinating. These are the, the zodiac signs. Um, this seems to be one of the earliest depiction of the Western zodiacs. Of course, it's coming through uh, South Asia and Central Asia. Uh, and they merge together. So local Chinese uh, and, and things coming from elsewhere merging uh, at, at a place in, in the Liao territory in a tomb belonging uh, to uh, Han Chinese. So this is a fascinating part of Buddhist cosmopolis uh, for me. So where do the images come from? Uh, the images most likely come from Japan. Um, and, and so this is the Big Dipper mandala that, that was uh, uh, drawn in Japan. And it seems from Japan, this idea, this concept uh, spread to the Liao, but it may have originated in the esoteric text in, during the Tang Dynasty that people like Amogu Vajra uh, were translating. And from there, it spread to Japan. J Japanese then created these kinds of diagram and this diagram then went into a tomb in the Liao Dynasty. This is uh, for me a really fascinating way in which things move and they converge in a space that uh, we don't realize is important for the study of, of Buddhism. Uh, so that's one example uh, to borrow the idea of convergence uh, from uh, Homi Baba. The other one also very interesting for me is what the Japanese were doing. It seems the Japanese uh, did not travel to India before the 17th century, Japanese monk that is. We know the Koreans were visiting. Um, Japanese, it seems, uh, stayed back. Uh, they were going mostly to China. But they imagined India through the writings of uh, the Chinese monks. And, and this is how they imagine India by reading uh, the text of Xuanzang, uh, putting the text into a context of uh, India's map. Uh, and and uh, Fabio Rambelli has written uh, fascinating articles on this. So you can see how they have mapped India by just reading uh, the text of, of Xuanzang's pilgrimage or, or, or visit to India. Uh, and for me, this is an important example of how the Japanese who can't travel to India uh, are, are imagining uh, in, uh, through a Chinese text. Again, emphasizing uh, the cosmopolitan way of in which Buddhism is connected through, through imagination. Um, now, this is, uh, was on, on the flyer that uh, I deliberately gave that uh, this uh, image on the left uh, upper corner because this is people would just look at this image and, and not know what this is about. This is a uh, Persian um, and nobody would realize that that person on the right uh, is the Buddha um, and, and the person on the left is Mara. Um, so this is a uh, Buddhist story uh, depicted in a Persian uh, uh, document and, and illustrated uh, and, and the image below uh, of, of the trees is the Jetavana and on the right, uh, I think people would have a hard time if they have not seen uh, this, this uh, image before, is the, the mother of the Buddha, um, the Maya, uh, about to give a birth. She's holding a branch of the tree and Buddha, as many of you perhaps know, 
would, would come down from her armpit. But this is again, representing the story of, 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 of the Buddha in a very different context and different images and, and so forth. Uh, so I think this is again, a fact where diversity uh, is, is there, but you, you see the connection to the Buddha and Buddha story uh, in Iran, uh, in, in Persia, I think that's, that's very important. Recently, there was an exhibition, uh, I think, in the British Library on, on Buddhism in uh, Europe and Africa. And, and if people have not uh, read through this, this book, it's really fascinating work to look at Buddhism beyond Asia and, and see how the stories would spread. Uh, so in, part of the imagination is related to stories that are usually orally transmitted from one place to another. So I think what we, what we can see is this idea of a Buddhist cosmopolis expanding uh, and, and we should be looking at this expanded Buddhist cosmopolis that connects to, to Europe uh, uh, in, in many times, uh, and of course to Persia uh, in the earlier Mongol, Mongol times. So let me I'll end with this, this section uh, with regard to value uh, and, and materiality, and I call it post-materiality because some of the objects are not necessarily used for uh, de uh, devotion purposes or worshiping. Uh, uh, of Buddhism, uh, but they serve different uh, roles as, as things go on, uh, as uh, the Buddhist cosmopolis expands. Uh, and, and then here I, I borrowed the concept of uh, the French sociologist Jean uh, uh, Baudrillard uh, on, on value making. And he looks at uh, objects not from the side of production as Marx had done, but from the perspective of consumption. Uh, and, and for me, that's, that's an interesting way of, of uh, figuring out why did the Buddhist objects matter to people who are using it. And, and that use for me uh, is part of consumption. We see the functional, well, these are some of the things that uh, Jean Baudrillard points out, the functional value. In my case, would be uh, the Buddhist monasteries, which provided medical care. It, it served a very important function, especially as people were moving through Central Asia or the maritime routes. Uh, it had exchange and economic value. We can see this, and, and, and Lucian Ru has written about the sale and purchase of Buddhist artifacts, even the involvement of Buddhist monasteries in economic activities. So there is an important economic value to the objects of the seven jewels that Lucian Ru talks about. Uh, there's a symbolic value. Um, uh, Buddhist uh, architecture is, is an interesting uh, aspect of valuing uh, Buddhist objects uh, and how that is that can be used. There's a sign value, uh, which uh, uh, for me is the prestige value with Buddhist relics. Uh, and I just wanted to just talk about this prestige value uh, as an example here. Uh, and since Susan mentioned that I'm working on, on Chengha, uh, I'm looking at Chengha and Buddhism as well. I've written a little bit about that. Uh, but suddenly we see different kinds of evidence which indicates uh, Chengho although he was born a Muslim, uh, was somehow practicing Buddhism as well. So I think that part needs to be emphasized uh, and not forgotten. Um, but clearly one of the things that uh, he does, and, and it's quite interesting, uh, is how he gets the Buddhist uh, tooth relic or Buddha's tooth relic uh, from Sri Lanka to, uh, to, to China, to, to the Ming Dynasty. And this has to do with Yungla Emperor uh, then becoming um, the emperor of the Ming dynasty, illegitimate for some of them, but I have argued that by using the tooth relic, uh, there's a sense of legitimizing the usurpation of the Ming uh, throne by Yungle, and, and that is why perhaps uh, Chang'e is bringing the tooth relic. Uh, this, this comes from a very uh, interesting source. This is a Ming edition of uh, Xuanzang Tatang Xi Yishi, the, his, his travelogue, and, and that comment is added uh, to the section on Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, this record of Chengke bringing a tooth relic is found in two places. One is this, uh, uh, the Ming edition of Katang Xi Yi the other is uh, a letter that uh, Yungle had written to uh, a Lama in Tibet, and that letter gets preserved uh, and discovered in 1950s. The text is actually very, very similar. Uh, this is in Chinese, uh, this is uh, in English, that uh, Yungle Emperor dispatched uh, Chengke and, and we know from, from Sri Lanka, for example, there's a very important inscription in three different languages. Um, and Chengha was there. And, and it seems that he uh, took the Buddhist relic after a fight. Uh, and it's fascinating, this Buddhist uh, tooth relic. 
um, tends to disappear and re reappear. So after Chunka, it reappeared and the Portuguese took it. Um, and then it reappeared, the, the British took it and destroyed it, but it somehow came back and it's still there. Um, so, so this is uh, an important part of later uh, Buddhist uh, influence on, on Chinese politics, you can say, how this relic, this value of the relic is there for, for Jungler to use uh, to, to basically legitimize uh, himself. We also find different uses of, of Buddhist artifacts. This is again, interesting, uh, an artifact that was found uh, in Stockholm. Uh, we, we are not sure if this was by somebody who was actually practicing Buddhism or there's a market value attached to this object. Uh, and, and so it, it appears in a, in, a, in a very far place that we would expect a Buddhism to be, but this is a different kind of a value for me uh, than the relic that was used uh, in, in the Ming, Ming Dynasty. Uh, something similar happens in Australia. Why does this artifact show up? Uh, somebody collecting it, somebody just transmitting it, maybe uh, somebody who was practicing Buddhism on the ship carried this image. But we find these kinds of objects in different places. And, and for me, I think the value of these objects in different places could be different. And, and that's, I think, again, a part of uh, Buddhist cosmopolis where there's a diversity, not only in practicing, but also valuing uh, Buddhist objects. And then finally, uh, this image, although India and China are not that friendly these days, uh, this was an uh, image created uh, when uh, I think the two pri oh, the prime minister of India and, and Xi Jinping, the president of China, met. Uh, the idea was to promote through that kind of a painting uh, the India-China friendship, uh, emphasizing the earlier links. Uh, but this is, again, for me, an, an, an object that has a different value, perhaps uh, the value of promoting Buddhist connections or reviving Buddhist connections uh, between China and India. Uh, but you can see the very interesting ways in which the contemporary divinities are depicted uh, in, in the image. Uh, let me just conclude, uh, and, and then I, I think there will be time for Q&A. Um, some of the, the things uh, for examining uh, the Buddhist cosmopolis, right? Um, so one of the important things is to understand the diversity of, of Buddhism within this context of, of cosmopolis, the diversity of Buddhist ideas, the diversity of images, uh, the diversity of people who circulated, uh, especially during the pre-colonial period, I think is, is quite important. The other is, uh, and I've been arguing a number of times that the spread of Buddhism was not unidirectional but it was multi-directional. Uh, sometimes things came back to where they originated and we see that uh, Buddhism coming back uh, to, to India from China, as I mentioned, uh, but you can see the back and forth between China and Japan, China and Korea and, and, and so forth. So this process of understanding the, the spread of Buddhism's different schools, uh, I think we should conceptualize it as a multi-directional process sometimes um, coming back to the places of origin, transformed. Um, now, uh, the connection between, uh, between trade and, and Buddhism has been done, but uh, lately I've been looking at the connection between uh, the spread of Buddhisms uh, through the, the network of migrants, uh, and especially the Chinese migration that takes place, brings Huan in to different places, including back to India. <coughs> but this is again, the, the existing networks creating or facilitating the, the movement of Buddhism and Buddhist ideas, it can be different forms of, of Buddhism. And I, I would encourage you to look at this article I, I wrote uh, uh, last year on how the Chinese migrants were taking different forms of Buddhism, especially a very localized form of Buddhism from South China to Southeast Asia and from Southeast Asia uh, to India. I think that's a very fascinating way of understanding the movement of Buddhism in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, uh, one of the reasons I see Buddhism or Buddhist practices become uh, successful is, is the way in which um, various local sacred sites are created. So people don't have to always go to India, the holy sites where the Buddha was born, where he died, at Nirvana, or, or, or those kinds of things. But the local places serve that purpose. And, and this is, uh, I would say, Homi Baba's uh, creation of, of interesting spaces where the convergence takes place between local uh, and, 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 and India, and, and, and that's, that space is very, very important for the people practicing Buddhism in a local uh, region. 
and, and, and this notion of imagined community, even though they have local sites, how they imagine distant places and distant uh, figures, including the Buddha himself, uh, I think is, is quite important as well. The part of being uh, of an imagined community, I think is important to understand um, uh, the Buddhist uh, cosmopolis that I'm, I'm arguing today. Now we can also think about uh, within the Buddhist cosmopolis, uh, different worlds and, and world historians have talked about uh, that uh, there are multiple worlds within within the connected world uh, of itself. Uh, and I, uh, we, we can see multiple different worlds, um, different due to the practices, the, the emphasis on, on particular kind of images, but they're all uh, connected to each other. And, and, and so if you are going to borrow something from the world historians, uh, or the idea of the world system, uh, the world system has multiple worlds, but connected, um, extremely diverse, uh, but also very, very intimately connected. So I'll, I'll end with that. And uh, I hope uh, you have questions, uh, maybe criticisms as well. Uh, so Susan. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's very, very inspiring. Uh, I love the idea of Buddhism's and also, uh, you know, how uh, different school and people formulate a larger imagined uh, community. I think what you say uh, today really challenge our conventional view, trying to, uh, you know, define Buddhism in terms of, uh, you know, kind of static uh, and unchanging uh, traditions. So, all right, uh, without further ado, let me uh, open up for questions. Uh, here we see uh, some questions already typed. Uh, the first question, I already saw this uh, before you gave a talk. So uh, I wonder if Margaret uh, Bohm, uh, are you satisfied with uh, our speaker's uh, answer? I, you know, if, if uh, he already answered your question, but this question is a larger one. Uh, she asks, uh, can you explain the steady movement to the East by Buddhism out of India and apparently not to the West? West, or did you also move west? Uh, the, the, did it also move west? Um, well, I, I, yeah, I think uh, I pointed out it moved west, but it doesn't have to be the same kind of Buddhism moving east, west, uh, south. So, and it doesn't have to move from India. It can move from another place. So it seems that some of the uh, ideas that reached Persia was not necessarily all through India. It may have been going through Tibet and, and China. Uh, it seems that some of the Chan monks uh, in, in Tibet, uh, Central Asia, were playing an important role connecting um, that part of the world to Ilkhanate, uh, the Persian Ilkhanate uh, under the Mongols. Um, so one, one thing we have to uh, be uh, aware of that not all movements take place from India. Uh, and, I, I, and the idea of this cosmopolis from is that there are multiple centers. Uh, and, and the ideas uh, related to Buddhism can move from one place to another. And it did move uh, to the West, as we see it, based on the stories, objects did move, but it was not the same kind of Buddhism that we see in Southeast Asia or, or, or China or Japan or Korea. Uh, yes, uh, I think the West is important. And, and even today we can talk about Buddhism in the US, right? Richard Gere uh, is one of the leading uh, advocates them, that's that's West. So it doesn't have to be limited by a period as well. The so the 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 Buddhist cosmopolis, if we see today, includes the U.S., uh, California in particular. I don't know about Texas, but I know New Jersey has lots of uh, uh, Tibetan uh, uh, monastic communities. So yes, I mean uh, the westward spread uh, is not limited to Europe. It goes comes to, to the U.S. as well. Good. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to the next question by Joseph Horov. Uh, he asks, uh, in what ways do mandala or cosmic maps shape and influence the various Buddhist polities and locales in imagining the various interpretive horizons as Buddhist cosmopolis? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the mandalas in some way is a depiction of an imagined Buddhist cosmopolis, not in the world, but in the universe, right? So, so there are heavenly objects in the mandalas, uh, uh, and and certainly uh, it is perhaps uh, one school or two schools of Buddhism using the the mandalic representation to see themselves within the context not only of this world but the world beyond. So, I I, I think it's a good way of understanding uh, how the monks uh, 
making the mandalas see themselves fit into a larger universe. Uh, as you know, the universe itself is part of the Buddhist teaching, right? So, so that's, that's, I think, an earlier depiction of a Buddhist cosmopolis uh, through a mandala. So I, I would totally agree that it's, it's an important way of understanding how some groups of Buddhist uh, practitioners saw themselves fit in the larger world, and that larger world will be, for me, a Buddhist cosmopolis. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Jakey uh, Mensings. Uh, and that's actually my question. Uh, do you have more information about the baby Buddha found in Australia? No, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> so I, I just found that fascinating um, uh, where it comes from because it's, it's not something that you find usually in South Asia, for example. Do you uh, know where the context where he, it was found? Was it in a... Uh, a tomb or a temple, a, no. you know, sacred site? No, I, I think it was just found in an excavation of some backyard, but I have to look look that up. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's a good archaeological report on, on, on that, uh, but there are movement of people, and, and, and it would be clear that uh, it's because it's not found in the context of a Buddhist uh, site, right? So it's, it seems that, I mean, even the Stockholm one as well, uh, there's no context as such. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because this is how objects move. It end up where it perhaps should not end up. Um, but uh, somebody should put it in Australia. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, maybe we should city scan uh, this statue, uh, which is very <laughs> fashionable nowadays. Yeah, you might find something inside. Yeah, maybe we'll find something inside. Okay, uh, next one by uh, Kerr Huntsman. Uh, do you have other examples of imagination uh, that is imagine uh, Buddhist places? Yeah, I, I think there's one thing that people have not really looked at is how uh, the monks in India imagined China, because we know that there was knowledge about, about China. And this is, again, why I Ching's uh, uh, texts are important, because he has conversation and, and showed us uh, Xuanzang, uh, how, uh, and it shows up in their text rather than in, in Indian texts, how uh, monks in, in Nalanda, for example, are thinking about uh, China. Uh, and this is, again, related to ultimately uh, monks from India going to uh, to Bhutashan for pilgrimage. So yes, I, I think there are various other examples where you can see people imagining distant places, especially pilgrimage places. I mean, this happens with, with Tibetans, I'm, I'm sure as well, uh, how they're imagining. Uh, Tony Huber has written a very fascinating book about how the Tibetans uh, conceived of pilgrimage sites in South Asia. Uh, so yeah, I, I think this, this, I think was a common phenomena that, that we find it's just that people have not focused on that aspect of the connections. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know, the next three questions are kind of connected, so I'm going to ask them together. Oh, I lose them. All right, so I'm going to combine Rudy, uh, Margaret, and Jennifer's uh, questions together. Uh, you know, they are uh, interested in knowing uh, how Buddhist cosmopolis concept could be applied to the contemporary context. And I think that you probably already addressed a little bit of that. Uh, she was curious about uh, the immigrants, uh, you know, in the Western converts. Uh, Margaret's uh, question uh, is, you know, a little bit similar. She was wondering if uh, there is an example of Buddhism in Italy, uh, you know, uh, that later become the Christian world. And uh, any Buddhism in Roman Empire? Uh, that's the question by Jennifer Gao. I, I, think, I think it's a good topic to study, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, one thing that is very clear is uh, the, there's a connection between uh, migration and uh, spread of Buddhism uh, that happens because of the movement uh, of, of Chinese migrants in the 18th, 19th centuries, but also the movement of Tibetans to different places. I, I'm, I'm sure also in, in Italy, some of the Tibetans may have ended up uh, in, in Italy. Uh, so I don't know if there are uh, monastic communities in Italy uh, or were there in, in the Roman, but I'm sure there were artifacts going back and forth uh, in the earlier stages. Uh, and no. with my 
Mm. Uh, I think that there is a, a Vantagon, in Vantagon uh, collection, there are some Buddhist uh, scriptures uh, in, in the collection. It's just that nobody really studied them. And it, it would be really fascinating to dig into the Christian collection uh, to look at the, the Buddhist artifacts. No, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely uh, important, I think, uh, because or did they go as part of practice or did they go as part of, of a valuable object? Mm -hmm. uh, that right, a, right. That's another question. Right. So I think from Central Asia, when Oral Stein went, he just picked everything that he could, could get mm -hmm. from the Tumwa case. He was not worried about, uh, about what text he was collecting. So in, in that same process, uh, uh, I'm sure that some texts move on um, because they look nice, because there was yes. some value to it. So, yeah. Indeed. All right. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So moving on, uh, the next one by Ahmed uh, Ansari. Could you speak to uh, ex interactions between Buddhism and other system of beliefs such as Hinduism, Jainism, Taoism in South and East Asian circuits around the time as well as within China? That's a huge topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think there is a re really fascinating kinds of interactions happening between Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Hinduism, whatever kinds of Hinduism you want to talk about, uh, from the very early on to the later periods between Buddhism and Islam. There's a whole book on Buddhism and Islam. Uh, of course, there's lots of studies on Buddhism and Taoism, the dialogue, uh, the competition that happened between the Buddhist and the Taoist. Uh, Susan would know that. And, 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 uh, so there's an interesting book called Laughing at Tao. There's a debate between Buddhist and, and the Taoist. Buddhism and Confucianism, uh, Buddhism and Shinto, so uh, Buddhism and local practices. I, I think that's the more fascinating part uh, is the not the established religion and Buddhism, but Buddhism and local beliefs, mm -hmm. how they interacted with each other, which mm -hmm. for me right. is the most interesting things yes. to look at yes. rather than the established uh, religions. Right. I like your idea of conversion. I think that it would be a very effective uh, uh, concept when we study how things localize and converge. Okay, Vidya want to know, uh, you know, more about Zheng He's visit to Sri Lanka. Why did he uh, took the? Why did he take the tooth relic? Uh, <laughs> I think you yeah. write about this. Yeah, I've written uh, an article about this, and, and my argument is that uh, the, the relic, uh, if you look at the importance of the relic in Sri Lanka, it actually legitimized the rulership at that moment. I mean, whoever had control over the relic in Sri Lanka would say that I'm the legitimate ruler of this place. Uh, and at that time in Sri Lanka, there were three uh, contending polities as well. So uh, Cheng He and Yung Le, interest in, in the Indian Ocean and legitimizing it himself uh, in the Indian Ocean realm, seems to have thought that the relic would give him some kind of a legitimacy abroad. Uh, it's for internal consumption because Yungla was also using Buddhist artifacts to play an important role within China. The Ming Dynasty say that he is the rightful ruler. He was inviting Tibetan Lamas to worship for him. So it, it had a dual purpose, one legitimizing himself in China uh, and the other legitimizing himself as a powerful entity in the Indian Ocean. So I would, I would recommend you read uh, the article uh, I have written on Chandra and Sri Lanka. Right, right, me too. Okay, uh, Michael Ruby want to know, uh, could you explain more on the, uh, the early monasteries at, uh, as sites of medical care? Yeah, I, I think not only medical care, this is also important because uh, people would stay there as, as a hotel, you can say in quotation marks, uh, because as they are moving through Central Asia, for example, they would need some kind of uh, health care, they would need place to stay. And it seems that uh, many of the monasteries located in what we, are, we call the Silk Roads were serving that purpose of, of providing medicine uh, and many of the medical texts are found in Central Asia, which, which uh, are about curing various kinds of diseases. Um, but also uh, the practice of medicine within the monastic communities. Lots of people live in monastic communities. They got sick and, and they had to have medicine. So um, this is something that was already there in monastic communities. But also there were spaces for people to come and stay. And one of the ways in which um, you know, many of the monasteries raised uh, money or donations 
was through getting these people who stayed or used their facilities to donate to the monastic communities. So uh, by serving the needs of these traveling people, uh, medical care or, or providing lodging, um, the monasteries itself was getting donations. So it, it, it happens almost everywhere where the monasteries are located. Uh, one is the need to sustain their own population through medical care. The other is that they can provide it to the others. Uh, today also, Taiwanese Buddhist communities are engaged in a huge number of uh, medical care facilities. Suti, for example, runs lots of hospitals uh, around, uh, around the world. Uh, so you can see that it's called the engaged or humanitarian Buddhism, uh, which is what's primary role is to provide medical care to people in different parts of the world. Okay. All right. Uh, Michelle Hurst wants to know about the Liao Tum mirror that you show us. And uh, she was wondering uh, if, if there's any symbolic meaning to put the mirror on the ceiling. I, I think it's, it's a Chinese importance of, of uh, the mirror and a lot has been written about the symbolic value of mirror. Uh, in, in this context, I, I think the, the, the diagram itself is representing the universe uh, as mandalas do. And, and uh, the, the mirror is served to reflect on that. It has a reflective quality, and, and so, so I, I think it's it's in a Chinese context, uh, and also the mandalic context. It fits very nicely there. Right. Okay. Penelope Pastor uh, want to know more about Tibet. How does Tibet fit into the cosmopolis? Yeah, it, it's very important part. I mean, uh, because uh, when Buddhism spreads to Tibet, it connects to China, it connects to India, it connects to Mongolia. Um, so under the, the Mongols, for example, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is spreading uh, to uh, what is uh, southern Siberia as well. So Tibet uh, also connected to uh, Persia as well. So I think um, uh, Tibet plays uh, another uh, role as a multiple center that I was talking about. It is one of the centers. It's, we should not see Tibet as a periphery to either India and China, but it is a center for transmission of uh, its own form of Buddhism. But, people would call Lamaism, uh, and it becomes popular, and that's what you see in, in the U.S. So uh, I would say Tibet is an important center for transmission of Buddhism, had been earlier stages uh, and, and in the later stages as well. So yes, Tibet plays an important role in the Buddhist cosmopolis. Okay, uh, I, I'm sorry, we are running out of time, so I can only uh, take uh, certain questions. Uh, you know, Stephanie Bob will ask you, can you say more about how this focus on the Buddhist cosmopolis uh, Mopolis, uh, complicates the narrative of Sinitic Buddhism and its spread through Asia in the medieval period? Actually, I have very similar questions, so could you address Yeah, that? I, I think uh, the, the Sinitic or Chinese Buddhism uh, is, is not a proper way of, of looking at the different forms of Buddhisms that were taking place. It's Chan, just a Sinitic Buddhism, Kentai, uh, uh, just, uh, Sinified Buddhism, because we know the role of, of Japan in, in uh, Kentai Buddhism. So I, I think the, the issue is, uh, is to not use uh, a state uh, or, uh, or perhaps a status way of looking at Buddhism, because these, these kinds of Buddhist schools were very, very localized, uh, had different forms and origins uh, as well. So I, I think it's, it's to localize some of these Buddhism, I would rather call it them by schools uh, that came about due to various kinds of interactions. So you can't just say Kintai, for example, is just Chinese school uh, without looking at the Japanese uh, input in that. Even the Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism in Japan, you can't say it's a J Japanese Buddhism. Uh, we, we, we know the link. And then, the, then we talk about Bodhidharma as coming from, from India and starting the Chan school. So what's, what's the Indian contribution to that? Uh, same with the esoteric Buddhism um, that we call uh, Michao in, 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 in China. Uh, there's lots of connections to Sri Lanka, right? Uh, we think Sri Lanka is a Theravadic uh, uh, place, but you know, it was very famous for esoteric teachings as well. We tend to forget uh, Javanese uh, Buddhism as well. So I think if you categorize it as Chinese or Indian or, or Southeast Asian, it becomes problematic. I think the best way perhaps is to look at different schools uh, that transcended uh, different borders and boundaries and, and different places. And that's what makes, I think, the study of Buddhism more interesting to look not at uh, uh, the, the geopolitical spaces, but space generally and, and how interconnected they were. Yes. 
Okay, great. Uh, this is so inspiring. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sin. And I want to thank uh, the enthusiastic audience today. I saw a lot of friends here. Uh, hello. And so, uh, you know, please uh, stay tuned with our coming events. And uh, if uh, your friends missed today's talk, uh, we are going to upload the recording very soon. And so please check back uh, the Chow Center uh, website, or you can simply Google uh, uh, Dr. Tan uh, Tencent Sen's talk uh, in YouTube. Uh, after a few days, uh, you'll find it. So thank you again, and I hope everybody is having a great, uh, great day, evening or morning. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>